Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for today's NIOSH Total Worker Health webinar, Overlapping Vulnerabilities in the Aging Workforce. I'm joined today by Drs. Jim Grosh and Julianne Scholl, the co-directors of the NIOSH National Center for Productive Aging and Work, who will serve as moderators for today's webinar. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Grosh, who will start us. Great. Thank you very much, Reed. I'd like to welcome everybody today to this webinar. Uh, a lot Along with Julianne Scholl, uh, I'm, uh, we, were, we were both uh, co-directors of the National Center for Productive Aging and Work at NIOSH. And we're really happy people can join us today for this webinar. And the focus, as you know, is on overlapping vulnerabilities in the aging workforce. And it basically reflects the fact that, as we all know, the workforce in the United States and many other countries is getting older. It's aging, along with the population. Uh, but one thing that isn't as well recognized or talked about is the fact that as it ages, it also becomes more diverse. So the webinar today is going to be looking at different areas of diversity in the aging workforce. And by diversity, I'm referring to things like ethnicity, gender, disability, uh, also socioeconomic factors like education and income. And I think at some point today during the webinar, webinar you'll be hearing about each of those and some of the implications of this kind of changing diversity for the aging workforce. So let me just start with um, a uh, introduction of our speakers. And I'm trying to advance our slides. And let me see if I can do that. Yes, there we go. Um, so let me just... Uh, give you a sense of the presentation today. We have three internationally recognized experts on this topic, and we're very happy that they can join us. Our first speaker will be Dr. Joanne Crawford. Dr. Crawford is a chartered er ergonomist and human factor specialist and a fellow of the Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors at the Institute of Occupational Medicine in Scotland, where she's presenting from today. She has more than 20 years' experience working in higher education as a lecturer and senior lecturer in ergonomics and since rejoining IOM in 2007 in research. Her research has included systematic reviews covering topics such as aging and work, mental well-being, firefighter health risks, and the health of health professionals. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Jennifer Swanberg. Dr. Swanberg, a professor of health policy and management, recently joined Providence College as the Dean of the School of Professional Studies. Prior to Pop Providence College, she was a professor at the University of Maryland School of Social Work, where she was also the director of the University of Maryland Work Family and Wellbeing Research Group. Her research focuses on the development of workplace and public policies that promote worker health and work-life fit. Dr. Swanberg's ex expertise includes low-wage work, occupational health disparities, worker health, work-life, and designing and implementing community and industry-engaged studies utilizing innovative, qualitative, and quantitative research designs. Finally, we'll be hearing from Dr. Richard Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a senior fellow in the Income and Benefits Policy Center at the Urban Institute, where he directs the program on retirement policy. His current research focuses on older Americans' employment and retirement decisions, long-term services and supports for older adults with disabilities, and state and local pensions. Recent studies have examined job loss at older ages, occupational change after age 50, employment prospects for African Americans and Hispanics over age 50, and the impact of the 2007-2009 recession and its aftermath on older workers and future retirement incomes. So that's our panel for today. And let me, before we actually get to the presentations, and Julianne will have a, a little bit to say about the topic as well in just a minute, let me move on to just a few housekeeping items in terms of today's presentation. Um, your audio, 
as you can see at the, the top of the slide, will be coming from your computer speakers or earphones. Please ensure that your volume is turned up to a comfortable level. For further technical support, please contact Adobe Connect uh, regarding meeting, any meeting support. Captions are available for this meeting for anyone who would like to follow along. Captions can be viewed in real time in Adobe Connect screen or opened in a separate web browser window via, via the link provided in the notes uh, for attendees box. Uh, this is a screen just to give you an idea of the different parts of what you'll be seeing in Adobe Connect. Much of the information that was covered in the previous slide is included in the notes for attendees box. So you may refer to that throughout the webinar. Anyone wishing to supplement their viewing experience may email teleworkerhealth at cdc.gov to request the unedited transcript of today's webinar. During the webinar, you can submit comments, questions, or problems to the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. All presenters and meeting hosts will be able to see what you submit into the box and can respond accordingly. You may submit questions throughout the presentation. However, content-related questions will be addressed only at the end of the webinar during the question and answer session. If you would like to download any of the slides shared during our presentation today, you may do so just below the question and answer box on your screen. Finally, just a word about continuing education credits. Uh, free continuing education credits are available for this presentation through the CDC's Training and Continuing Education Online System. Detailed instructions on accessing the Training and Continuing Education Office site are available for download. Note that the orange activity number is only valid for those watching this live webinar. You will need the course access code to receive credit. The blue activity number is to be used only by those who view the archived webinar or attempt to access CEUs after December 3rd, 2000. This webinar will be recorded and posted in the near future for those who could not join us today. So with all that as a background, let me just turn this over to Julianne Scholl, the, the co-director of our center here, for some additional comments. Thank you, Dr. Grosh. To set the context for our guest presenters, I want to take a moment and share the NIOSH definition of total worker health. And this approach is described as policies, programs, practices that integrate, um, that integrate protection from work-related safety and health hazards with promotion of injury and illness um, prevention efforts to advance worker well-being. And the Office of Total Worker Health is, um, is, a, um, is a larger office in which the National Center for Productive Aging is hosted. Because uh, Total Worker Health is concerned with issues relevant to advancing worker well-being, promoting productive aging is one of those issues, and that's why NCPAW, or National Center for Productive Aging, is hosted. Uh, the center is a virtual one, and it was established in October of 2015. The goals of the center are to develop institute-wide research goals and leadership uh, related to workers of all ages as they age. Another goal is to facilitate both intramural and extramural research collaboration with partners. NCPAW also uh, fur furthers the knowledge on interventions and promising practices for creating what is called an aging-friendly workplace. Another goal is to, dis to develop and promote a broad range of products and resources that can be disseminated to our stakeholders. With that, I believe we have 
Oh, yes. Um, I apologize. Um, I want to set I want to set the uh, context for our webinar just a little bit more. Um, it it really helps to look at aging not just uh, within its own context, but also how it's connected to all these social and economic dynamics that help shape the experience of aging. To take a, a comprehensive view of aging, we have to consider such factors as class, race, gender, and other economic trends that contribute to aging workers' vulnerability. And so for today's webinar, we will explore uh, these three complementing views um, and how social and economic factors can influence the well-being, safety, and health of aging workers. Now, it is my pleasure to turn the mic over to Dr. Crawford. Thank you very much. Um, um, first of all, can I just say thank you very much to the Total Worker Health team and NIOSH for inviting me to take part in this webinar. And um, it's a real pleasure to do it. Uh, um, now, just to give you a bit of background, um, I work for the Institute of Occupational Medicine, also known as IOM, and we came out of the coal industry. Over, it, we, we have our 50th birthday next year, um, and we, do, we, we are... sort of across the UK and Singapore and we have worked with NIOSH and other groups in the US before. Now our origins were in the coal industry but we've, we've moved on since then to cover all sorts of different physical and mental workplace hazards, environmental impacts and air pollution. So what I want to talk about today is older women work in health and you know why specifically do we want to talk about older women? going to talk about healthy life years, um, sex differences in health outcomes, and then the M word, menopause. We'll talk a bit about gender segregation, um, the dual roles that some women have, and then how can we actually support women at work. Okay, now the basis of the presentation is some work that the IOM and others did for the European Agency for Safety and Health in 2016, which was two state-of-the-art reviews. And these are referenced at the end of the presentation and are freely available from the website. So let's start with the why. Why do we want to talk about uh, older women and work? There's really been limited research on this intersection between gender, age, and safety and health. Suddenly, we're being pushed to work longer. Um, up until about 10 years ago, I was going to retire at 60. Not anymore, it's 68. And it's, you know, there's this equalization of pension ages for which, you know, women are having to, you know, work longer um, and, you know, to prepare to be in, to, in the workplace for longer. But the thing about women is that we have a lot more care responsibilities. I know there are plenty of men who are involved in caring, um, but as, as, as sort of society, societal constraints, we tend to get pushed into certain roles. For example, horizontal segregation. There's more women in healthcare, in care, and in education. Um, and you know, women are exposed to physically demanding work. Have you seen the size of patients nowadays for nurses? You know, we're not getting any smaller. So, so we shouldn't assume that women's work isn't physically demanding. And it's certainly emotionally demanding. Um, so there's a boost to, ha to extend working life. Okay, that's internationally. Everyone's trying to think about well, how can we keep people at work longer? So we need to think about okay, there are things that happen as you age. There are some changes. They don't always prevent us from working, but let's have a realistic assessment of you know what what are the, the potential hazards and from that the risk for our older women workers. Now, I'm sure we're all aware that, you know, demographics have changed. We have, the great news is that we have extended life. 
And for example, in the UK, life expectancy for males is 78.8, and for females at birth, 82 years. But the thing is that life expectancy actually kind of depends where you're born and where you grew up. For example, in London, in Kensington and Chelsea, which has, you know, is one of the richest areas of London, life expectancy is 83.3 years. But if you come north to Glasgow in Scotland, life expectancy for males at birth living in the city is 73.4 years. And we're not a big country, but that 10 year, that 10 year difference you know, says a lot about social inequalities, about health, and about working life. So, if women live longer, shouldn't they work longer? Well, the gap between longevity between men and women is actually closing. But I want us to think about healthy life years. Now, a healthy life year is the number of years that a person at age 65 is expected to live in a healthy condition. And when I put, pulled out some data um, for the European Union, UK, USA, and Canada, life expectancy plus, you know, after 65 years, we can see, yes, women are still, you know, surviving longer than men. But when we put healthy life years into the equation, that means, you know, it's, it's, it's much smaller. And the difference between men and women is reduced. And one of the charts that um, that we developed, which I, you know, was based on something from um, the WHO, but I've, I've reused the data in a different way, talks about, you know, the percentage of time spent in ill health after the age of 65 years. And what the chart suggests is that women are actually spending more time in ill health. So we've got to think about, well, okay, how can we maintain health throughout life and how do we, you know, take our women through to retirement in a better state of health? And these, you know, these are challenging questions. And when we've looked at differences in ageing um, and health outcomes, that I think it's important to remember that ageing is an individual process. We have to try and avoid stereotypes. It doesn't happen that we suddenly get to 65 and realise, ah, I can't, I can't work anymore. You know, things change as we age, but it's, a lot of it is about remembering that, you know, we can sometimes help ourselves by, you know, better making good lifestyle choices or supporting others to make better life cho lifestyle choices. And, you know, this change isn't always sudden unless, unless there's some ill health involved. But our older workers are also really experienced bunch of people, and often they use their knowledge and experience to adapt jobs, to change the way they're working so they can continue to work. And I think what's imp also important to remember is that changes in health do not always impact on work performance. Okay? It's not, you know, it's, it's however you want to measure productivity, and there's so many different suggested ways, that, that people can actually continue to work by, you know, making small adaptations. But when we look at sex differences in health outcomes, there's been a large increase in the number of women diagnosed with COPD. Um, and these will be, this is European data. Um, there's limited evidence, which is not particularly strong or a very good study, in relation to job control and risk of stroke in women compared to men. So women are more at risk. Adult onset asthma is more prevalent in women, and osteoarthritis and osteoporosis are more frequent in women at a, at a younger age. And with osteoporosis, there's also the increased risk of, of, of potential fractures, sort of vertebral fractures. So, you know, we've, we've got to think about what jobs are people doing and how can we design those jobs to try and reduce risk. I want to talk about the menopause now. I'm, I don't know how, in the UK, it's something that, you know, it's kind of a taboo topic. I'm hoping it's not so much in the USA. But I think it's important that, you know, every woman goes, is going to go through this at some point. And some, people, some women will experience symptoms, some won't. 
and uh, you know the lottery for the menopause we're not quite sure what the rules are on that yet but some research done in the UK it was the, the academic in the photograph there she, she was just saying look we need to get rid of the scare factor with the word menopause you know you say it three times a day um, because you know it, it's something we need I think we need to talk about much more and yes there's lots of different symptoms, hot flushes or flashes, um, poor concentration, fatigue, lowered confidence, different types of symptoms. But the important thing is that not everyone will actually have these symptoms. And it's estimated, and there hasn't really been a huge amount of work done in, in this area, but 5% of women are actually going to have, have serious problems with their symptoms. But, you know, they, they may need to seek medical help or other help. Um, but what's also interesting is that people who have more control over their work seem to be able to cope better and manage their coping strategies. And really, there is a need to, for employers to be able to give support to people um, who are going through the menopause. We have helped, um, it was the Fire Brigade Union in the UK, we've helped them design their menopause policy, even though, you know, the majority of firefighters are still men, there's at least 10% of women. And it's, it's, it's that sort of thing of, right, well, let's train people. Training your line managers is essential. Let's get over the embarrassment thing. You know, this is a, something that happens to every woman. How do, we, how do we manage it? And often it can be simple things, access to water, layered clothing for, for, for uniforms, Openable windows, fans, you know, it doesn't have to be some expensive, you know, change of, of work or workplace, but actually just, just taking some, some sensible measures. But also just, you know, oh, the gremlins are in this afternoon. <laughs> so. Okay, right. When we think about um, different sectors, healthcare, we think about the physical exposures, biological, chemical, and psychosocial. You know, the, the, un, the unsocial hours, potential for violence, and emotionally demanding work. But also even in other industries, such as textiles, you know, where, where you have more women working. Again, different sets of exposures. So from horizontal segregation, you know, you have more women working in different sectors. But following on from that, there's vertical segregation, where women kind of get stuck down the work hierarchy. And it could be because they work part-time or they want to work part-time, so the job opportunity isn't there. But when you look at women over 50, fewer women actually hold management positions when compared to men. And more women are actually exposed to repetitive work or postural stress in the workplace and having a reduced control over work. So this is some data from Eurofound from across the, the European Union who, who actually asked if people in the age range of 50 to 54 think they would still be able to do the same job at age 60. And what we find is that from the left, where you have your professionals and managers and technicians, um, yeah, a lot of women professionals and managers, you know, at least a third, are saying, not, n not sure we can. But then going over to the right-hand side of the graph, where mid-skilled manual workers and low-skilled workers, you know, that's 50, over 50% 50 of women say they're not going to be able to continue to do the same job. So we've got to think about, well, how do we redesign work to fit people? And some of the questions we found when we were doing, doing the reviews was that more women do work part-time compared to men because they are still on, more often than not taking on child care responsibilities and other care responsibilities. But are they included when we're doing risk assessments? Are they able to access the same support um, from occupational health, from insurance companies, depending on which country you're in, who's, who's providing the support. And these are things that we need to investigate further. And sustainable work 
is, is one of these phrases. We've, in the UK, we've called it decent work. Um, the, IL, no, the ILO call it decent work. We would call it good work, as in good work is good for your health. In that we need to think about, well, how do we design work that's sustainable so that working and living conditions that support people and engage people to remain in work. If we want people to stay in work longer, we've got to improve how we are engaging and how we are designing work. But we also find that for female workers, there's often a dual role in there where men generally work more paid hours than women, and this is based on Eurofine data. If you use a combination of paid work, commuting, and unpaid work, women worked on average 60 four hours compared to men at 53.4 hours per week. And caring alone is a big part of that. Around half of the UK's caring population combines work with unpaid care. And many have had to give up work because they can't manage it. Now, we do have some exemplar companies in the UK who support carers and you know, actually help people to stay in work and balance, balance work. But what we really need to find is a better balance for both men and women um, in that we need to, to think about that you do have a right to ask to work flexibly in the UK and that has to be discussed with the relevant, you know, the managers and there has to be a sensible discussion about that and then decisions made. So what else can we think about in terms of supporting our older women? Workplace risk assessments, we all have to do them in whatever shape or form, that cover cumulative exposure to hazards. And, you know, when we think about musculoskeletal disorders, some of that is going to be a cumulative exposure. And so how do we assess that over 20 or 30 years? We need to take age and gender considerations into the development of sustainable work. We've been gender blind about risk assessment and you know about des designing work. We maybe need to actually rethink this process. Are we missing some of the hazards? When you're doing risk assessment assessments or you know looking at different safety as aspects, including women and part-time workers in this process, get them on the safety committees. And then equal access to support mechanisms, occupational health, safety, rehabilitation. And then thinking about things like job enlargement. If you have people who are you know, exposed to highly repetitive workplaces, you know, can, we, can we make their job a bit, can we change the job? Can we give them more tasks to do to break down those, those specific, you know, the, the repetitive nature of work? And there are bigger societal questions that I, you know, we can't, pretend to, to, to answer just in, from safety and health, where you've got to think about women's career development, flexible work patterns for women and men. Um, you know, sometimes looking back to having children growing up, that it was always assumed it was, the, it was my responsibility to take care of them and things. And it's like, well, actually, you know, if we're, where people are, you know, around having both parents and, and sharing, you know, the care, the leave, and, and things like, you know, the time that's required to look after family. And within the research community, actually collecting data, not correcting. Um, you know, putting in, oh, well, you know, we've done, we've done um, not just correcting for sex differences, we've actually, you know, collected data on this particular group. So I'd like to say thank you very much for the time today. Um, sorry about the breakdown, and if you want to require any further information, please don't hesitate to get in touch. And I'd quite like now to pass to Dr. Jennifer Swanberg, who's going to talk about the next presentation. Terrific. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. 
Well, um, thank you, uh, Joanne, and hopefully uh, I won't encounter similar uh, gremlins, as you call them. Um, it's really my pleasure to have this opportunity to share my research on the occupational safety and well-being of older workers uh, in low-wage jobs. I'd like to thank uh, Jim Grosh and the team at Total Worker Health for this invitation to join this esteemed panel, and to also thank the CDC and NIOSH. I also want to thank my um, collaborators on this project, Lily Scheinlin, a research assistant here at Providence College who was with me at University of Maryland when I did this work, as well as Gail Betts. So the impetus for this research on looking at uh, the intersection of older workers and low-wage work came about um, from an invitation of Dr. Jamie, uh, excuse me, Dr. Uh, Jackie James from Boston College Center on uh, Aging and Work. She asked me to prepare a paper for a conference on aging and work that happened uh, this past um, January, a conference that was sponsored by NIH, NIOSH, and the Sloan Research Network on Aging and Work. And while I had been, I've been studying um, issues pertaining to low-wage workers for some time, it's, it had been a while since I had been in the older worker space. So as a way to kind of in, reintroduce myself to this subject, I decided to kind of go to the literature and see, you know, what's currently known since I left this um, particular space. Uh, and to my surprise, there was very little research that specifically looked at the occupational health and well-being of older workers who were employed in low-wage occupations. So this set me out on a journey to try to understand who is this uh, worker population uh, and um, what are the vulnerabilities that they're experiencing as a result of the conditions of low-wage work. And as um, Jim Grosh kind of had pointed out, and I think we all recognize that our workforce is continuing to age. At the same time, our workforce is also um, increasingly um, engaged in low-wage work. So for the uh, objectives for the presentation today, the first is I'm going to present the context. Why focus on older workers in low-wage occupations? And then I'm going to describe the population who are currently um, older workers in low-wage jobs. And then I'm going to report on uh, um, results that came about from a narrative review that highlight key findings pertaining to how low-wage work conditions are influencing the health and well-being of older workers. So when I started kind of looking at this particular issue, I thought to myself, well, when we think about older workers, there's a set of vulnerabilities that they experience. And then when you look at low-income workers, there's a set of vulnerabilities that they experience. So I started thinking about this population as being doubly vulnerable, right? So as it was pointed out, we know that there's an increase in number of older workers. But, um, but um, I think it's less well known that over 44% of the U.S. workforce today earns less than $15 an hour. And this number increases to 60% for Hispanic workers and 53% of African American workers. So when we see here for older workers, older workers are likely to experience age discrimination, both implicit and explicit. They are more likely to feel financially insecure or have inadequate retirement savings. They have higher rates of under, under, unemployment. They have increased medical conditions. And oftentimes, they have an increased recovery time when they're injured. Among low-income workers, we know that they experience unpredictable, unstable, and, un, and inconsistent work schedules, which results in uh, financial insecurity. Uh, because of the low wages. Oftentimes, they have limited or no employer-sponsored benefits. And they tend to work in work environments that have both physically demanding jobs and demanding jobs from a psychosocial perspective. So as a result, I was thinking that this, uh, this worker population is probably more vulnerable than um, we might have thought previously. 
So the first step for me was to really understand who are these workers. And our um, investigation led us to a report that's been published by the Urban Institute that looked at the public, the name of the report is Occupational Projections for Low-Income Older Workers, Assessing the Skill Gap for Workers Age 50 and Older. And this report uh, relied on four different types of data sources to present uh, a full picture of workers in um, uh, uh, low-income workers, and let me say something about that. Um, there are kind of two different terms that are frequently used to describe workers who uh, make um, lower, workers at the lower end of the wage spectrum, low-wage workers versus low-income workers. For the purpose of um, this presentation, I'll be using both terms. Uh, the Urban Institute for their report, which I will present some of the findings now, relied on the term low income. And for them, older workers uh, were defined, or excuse me, low income workers was defined as those that were earning 30% or less of the federal poverty line after adjusting for household size. Uh, later on in the report, I will be reporting on low income, excuse me, low wage workers. And for that purpose of low wage, I relied on a wage of $15 uh, or, or less. Okay, so based on um, data from the American uh, Community Survey, we see here that when we look at um, among all the workers who are earning 300% uh, of the poverty line or less, we have, there's slightly more women across the different age cohorts. We see all workers, workers 50 to 59, 60 to 69, or 70 plus. When we look at race and ethnicity, there's a couple of interesting trends. One is that not surprisingly, kind of, there's kind of an increased proportion of older workers that are white. But as you can see, the younger cohort of older workers is more uh, racially and ethnically diverse in comparison to the older cohort. Likewise, you see that there, um, older workers, 50 to 59, are likely to, 75% of them are working full time, and that drops down to about 29%, 26% among the older cohort. And I think the other interesting factor for workers who um, earn 300% of the poverty line or less is that about half have a high school diploma or less. And that's pretty consistent across the, uh, the age cohorts. We look at um, worker characteristics. Among this population of low-income workers, more than half, uh, certainly more than half, um, or about half, are earning 200% of the poverty line or less. About half are married. and. Uh, a substantial number of individuals are experiencing um, health difficulties, and that number of health difficulties, not surprisingly, increases with age. So next I wanted to look at what are the most common occupations for workers in um, low-income households. Here what we see is um, some interesting trends. Among those individuals, who earn a high school diploma or less, who have a high school diploma or less, they're more likely to, or excuse me, those less than a high school education are more likely to be represented in transportation, building, and production industries. In comparison to those who have some college, and they're more likely to be represented in office and administration support, sales, and transportation. So what this suggests is, is, that, is that depending on the education level, workers are likely to be in different occupations. Um, I share this slide to demonstrate that when we look at where the growth is um, among low-income low occupations, we can see how little, or excuse me, how low the wage is among these, work, um, among these occupations. So for example, one of the highest or the fastest growing occupations is in um, home health services, where the median wage is $12 an hour. Personal care assistance, nearly $9 an hour. And food and beverage workers, $11 an hour. So going forward in the future, our older workers will continue to be vulnerable from a financial perspective. Okay, 
So the, the second question that um, I set out to answer was really trying to understand how low-wage jobs are influencing older workers and, and how they're influencing their occupational health and well-being. So I set out uh, to uh, conduct a narrative uh, review. We used a number of scholarly databases that are represented here. We restricted our uh, sample to those uh, research studies that were published in the last 10 years and that were published in English. And we used a variety of different keywords uh, that um, we identified through an iterative process. Uh, keywords that both focused on uh, various terms that would pick up older workers, low wage, and different occupations in which uh, low wage um, work is common. Here uh, um, you can see essentially I shared with you kind of the level of, kind of rigor we went through for this narrative review. Um, our initial uh, analysis yielded 1,843 articles which after we do deduplicated them what resulted in about 1,500 articles. And we screened them both in terms of abstracts and full article reviews, um, for, which yielded about 80 articles that seemed to be directly related to our research question. A thorough review of those articles led us down to 10 research articles that specifically looked at, in our mind and how we defined it, the impact of low wage work on um, older workers. So a, a result of the kind of culling through these articles, what we identified were a number of themes. Um, these articles or the, the working conditions that influence older workers were kind of categorized into two broad groups. One was kind of the work environment and the other conditions focused on uh, job conditions. And within the work environment, we further categorized the types of conditions that influenced older worker health. And these were perceived discrimination, learning and development opportunities, social relationships at work. Likewise, on the job condition side, we, we identified physical job demand, low wages and decision authority, and skill discretion as uh, organizational factors that influence hourly workers. And now what I'd like to do is take a few minutes to kind of describe each of these. So here are the three themes within the work environment. So four articles, um, four primary studies that looked at the effects of perceived discrimination on older workers in low-wage occupations uh, were conducted in home health care settings and retail settings. And there were several themes that emerged from these, these four studies. First, older workers were perceived that they offered value added to the employer because of their experience, wisdom, displays of experience, and understanding the client. However, they, per they, they perceived that they experienced unfair treatment due to their age. In another study, a comparison to younger workers, older home care workers were given fewer shifts and their schedules were unpredictable and inconsistent. And to, um, right, the perceived discrimination that they experienced led to poor morale and negative feelings toward their job. In another study of hotel workers, Research discovered that implicit biases among younger managers toward older workers and such workplace behaviors led to um, an unequal allocation of resources such as on-the-job training. Uh, another study found that perceived unintentional age discrimination among retail workers had adverse effects on employer engagement. And another study finally found that perceived age discrimination in impacted wages. Workers 55 and older earn significantly less than their workers 23 to 54. Um, two studies investigated the relationship between learning and development opportunities at the workplace. Uh, it was reported that learning and development opportunities were less available to low-income workers. 
However, according to these two studies, this population would be interested in these opportunities and feel that they would benefit from such. And in these cases where they were available, the population reported more positive experiences at work, including increased retention, job performance, and job satisfaction. The third dimension of the work environment that had an impact on, on um, workers' well-being was social relationships on the job. Here we had four studies that addressed the effects of social relationships at work, including relationships with supervisors, managers and coworkers, and on older workers' employment experiences. And given that I have a yellow um, uh, square staring me in the face, I'm going to just briefly touch upon these. As you can imagine that those workers who had um, positive relationships with their supervisors and with their coworkers experienced overall more positive outcomes on well-being and fewer um, occupational related injuries. The second category of um, literature that um, um, the second category of occupational factors that influenced worker health and well-being were job conditions. And these looked at both physical job uh, demands, decision authority, and low wages. We identified three studies uh, that were in the trades and maintenance set settings that looked at physical demands. Uh, and what we found was physical demands were associated with reduced productivity and bodily discomfort in older workers. Yet despite the demands, employment um, for these older workers contributed to their self-esteem, self-identity, uh, self and overall well-being. And those workers who were able to modify their work environment on their own in order to continue working uh, felt that the physical demands were worth, uh, were worth it, was, it was worth it to keep working because it helped them to continue to save for retirement. We also found that injury type varied by age and that older workers experienced um, longer recovery periods. Um, two articles specifically looked at the impact of low wages on worker well-being, and as you can imagine, financial insecurity was more prevalent among the workers making these low wages. Um, there was a significant proportion of uh, workers in one specific study that were unable to meet their basic needs, and many across both studies had, uh, were able to save for post-retirement years. And then finally, decision authority and skill discretion. There were four studies that specifically looked at this among older workers in, in retail, maintenance, and, and uh, um, that should say home health settings. Uh, what we found is that factors such as schedule control were associated with higher levels of engagement, Limited decision and authority into the number of hours worked and scheduling in comparison to older workers was associated with low morale and financial insecurity for older workers. And on the flip side, new skill acquisition was reported by older workers and it was more likely to report, um, they were more likely to report positive feelings at work. So across all of these studies, it was confirmed for us that uh, Older workers employed in low-wage occupations are doubly vulnerable. They're, um, they're represented in a variety of different um, industries and occupations, and, and industries and occupations that are known for having high rates of occupational injuries among all workers. Uh, we also found that uh, um, they were kind of vulnerable to a number of adverse consequences associated with perceived age discrimination, such as lower levels of employee engagement, poor morale, implicit bias, financial security, and the like. And overall, kind of our, one of our major takeaways was that more research specifically needs to be done on this worker population, and that um, more evidence-based practices are needed uh, to look at how we can reduce occupational risks for older workers across low-wage industry in order to enhance their overall well-being. The reality is, is that um, older workers, especially within the low-wage um, sector, are going to continue to work long beyond traditional retirement years, and they're more vulnerable to a variety of different uh, occupational health-related uh, issues. Uh, as such, future research is 
needed to specifically look at and intentionally look at this population and their unique uh, circumstances. Um, thank you. Next, I would like to um, uh, pass the baton to uh, Richard Johnson. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, NIOSH for the opportunity to discuss with you today socioeconomic differences in employment at older ages. And I'm going to be uh, exploring the evidence on the extent to which the potential for longer careers is available to all workers. Now first there are, um, I'm trying to, sorry about this. Uh, there are a number of benefits uh, to working longer. One is that um, by working longer, older adults can uh, improve the economy. So um, they're going to engage in productive activities uh, that is going to grow the economy. They're going to pay taxes. That helps the government budgets. Uh, and they're going to, uh, the, to the extent to which they work longer, they will delay the receipt of uh, retirement transfers. And so depending how these retirement programs are structured, that can uh, help the finances of these programs. Um, but these, um, working longer also helps individuals uh, financially. So by delaying retirement, people would earn more over their lifetimes. Those additional earnings uh, increases the earnings base uh, for Social Security and for pensions, so that raises their future retirement income. It also allows them to save more for retirement. Uh, it also reduces the time that those savings must last. So if your retirement period is shorter, your, your nest egg doesn't have to last as long. Uh, in addition, workers who uh, delay taking Social Security will get actuarial adjustments, increases to the Social Security benefit, so they get more each month. So according to one study by my colleagues here at the Urban Institute, uh, working an additional year on average raises old age income uh, by 9% uh, percent on average, and the impact is even larger for low income people. So working uh, one more year would raise their annual retirement incomes by about 16%. There's also evidence that uh, working longer can improve uh, health status of, of workers. Now this is a little more controversial, it's a little less uh, clear. Um, it kind of depends on the type of work that you're doing, um, but to the extent to which you stay in the workplace and you're engaged, uh, it gives purpose to your life, um, that can improve your emotional well-being. On the other hand, work can be stressful and that can uh, reduce your emotional well-being, um, but it could also just staying active can improve your physical health. Again, though, um, some jobs are physically demanding that could actually worsen your health. Um, but it's clear that working longer is going to improve one's uh, financial well-being. And the good news is that over the past two decades, we've seen a tremendous increase in uh, work activity at older ages. So this chart compares labor force participation, that is, uh, the share of people who are either working or actively looking for work, and it compares them in 1995 and 2016, and this chart is for men. So if you look at the first line here, this is ranged by age, um, these are the younger folks. So 1824, we've seen over that 21 year period, a big decline in participation rates uh, at younger ages, um, a small decline for uh, participation rates for men uh, ages 25 to 54, so those are sometimes called the prime age workers. Um, so it has been a, a small three percentage point decline. That is, is surprising, and there's a lot of research about why that might be happening. But the big story is at ages 62 and older. So you see at 62 to 64, there is a 13 percentage point increase in participation rates for men between 1995 and 2016. Uh, at uh, 65 to 69, there's a 10 percentage point increase, and also sizable increases uh, at ages 70 and older. So what's driving this? There's a number of factors that seem to be at play. One is um, that uh, there's the erosion in defined benefit pension plans uh, has um, eliminated the uh, work disincentives that those created. Um, there is also um, uh, erosion in retiree health insurance benefits uh, by employers, uh, makes it more expensive for people to retire before 65, so that keeps a lot of people in, in the labor force 
Uh, we see changes in Social Security. Uh, so the retirement age increased from 65 to 66, and it will continue to increase to 67. Uh, we see the elimination of the retirement earnings test after the full retirement age, so after 66 for people who are retiring today. That means that if you continue working while you're collecting Social Security benefits at those ages, you're not going to have to forfeit some of those benefits uh, as, as you work, as you, as you earn more. Uh, and then we have the uh, increase in the delayed uh, retirement credit. Basically, the longer you delay Social Security, the more your Social Security benefits will increase. And that increase uh, has, has risen quite a bit over the, uh, uh, the past 15 years or so. Um, what makes this, uh, these findings even more striking is that between 1970 and 1995, we saw a dramatic reduction in older men's uh, labor supply. So you see uh, this graph um, at 62 to 64 in the middle of the chart there, um, participation rates declined from 71% in 1970 down to 44% in 1995. Also large declines uh, for men in their late 60s and also after age 70. So, so the fact that we have this, this turnaround uh, really makes the increase we've seen over the past 20 years really quite remarkable. Uh, a similar story for uh, older women, this is again comparing 95 uh, results in 1995 to participation rates in 2016. And you see we see a big increase at, uh, for women in their uh, late 50s, for women in their early 60s, for women in their late 60s. Really quite sharp increases. Um, if we look at what happened over the previous 25 years, so 1970 to 1995, uh, employment at older ages didn't change much for women, but we see big increases in participation rates for younger women, women 25 to 44, women 45 uh, to 54. And so what's fueling the increase in participation rates for older women today is all the factors that we saw for women, but also the aging of these younger women, uh, these women who were working at younger ages in the 1970s and the 1980s and the 1990s, they're now, um, some of them are now in their 60s, and, and so they're, they had a whole career of working, and they're just continuing that uh, labor supply behavior into their older ages. Um, but the real question I want to focus on is, are these benefits available, the benefits of working longer, is that available to everyone? And really focusing on people with limited education, people with health problems, uh, workers who lose their jobs, and workers in physically demanding jobs. So um, the first thing to note is, as you would probably suspect, uh, better educated older adults are more likely to participate in the labor force than those with less education. And this chart is comparing participation rates in 2016 by education for men and women. So if we look at the, the blue bar, that's for men, uh, we see that college graduate uh, men with a four-year college degree, 35% uh, of them participate in the labor force at ages 65 and older, and this chart is just for people 65 and older. Uh, so that's almost uh, twice, as like, twice as high the percentage uh, as for high school graduates, who are 20% uh, uh, of whom are likely to, 20% um, of whom participate in the labor force. And then for those who did not complete high school, only 13% are participating in the labor force. So big differences between this 13% for people who didn't complete uh, high school and 35% for the four-year college, uh, people with four-year college degree. A similar uh, um, uh, findings for women, 7% of, of women who did not complete high school are, um, did not, 7% uh, of them are in the labor force, 65 plus, about uh, three times as many, 23% of college graduates are in the labor force. So, um, big differences there. If we um, see, though, well, how has this changed over time uh, by, um, by education? And so if we look at, uh, so here we're comparing just for men, 65 and older. The blue bar is 1995. The yellow bar is 2016. And again, we see that for uh, the high school graduates, uh, there's been a, a, you know, some increase um, for, for those who didn't complete high school, for the high school graduates, for some college. But much, much of the increase is really for those with a four-year college degree. There we see an increase in about uh, 7% percentage points in the share who are employed 65 plus. 
Uh, for women, we're seeing increases uh, really for people who um, spend some time in um, uh, college, so people who uh, attended college but didn't complete four years, and then the four-year grads, so that's really where the, the big increase. So what uh, obviously an important determinant of working at older ages is uh, health status. And so this chart is showing a trend in the percentage of adults uh, by age who are reporting fair or poor health uh, from 1972 to 2017. So the bottom line, that's for people 45 to 54, um, there what you see is that there is a, uh, we see a decrease um, in the share from, let's say, 1970, about 20, 1974, maybe 20% reported fair or poor health. By 2000, it had fallen to about 12%. Um, um, but since 2000, it's, uh, there's been a slight uptick in the share who are reporting fair or poor health. Similar patterns at other ages, 51 to 61, 62 to 65, 66 to 69. The basic story is that from about 1970 to about 2000, we saw some declines. Since 2000, um, there's sort of been, uh, a, a, this improvement has stalled, um, and in, at some ages, there's been a slight uptick in the share who are reporting uh, health problems. Uh, maybe, now that, that was fair or poor health, another measure is, do you have a work disability? Do you have a, a health problem that limits the type or amount of work you can do? Uh, and now, here are the, the, uh, the data series only goes back to 1997, um, but, you know, we see these, uh, again, for these, these four age groups, spanning the ages 45 to 69, um, not, much, uh, in, not much change, maybe a little bit of improvement uh, since the early 1990s for some of the older age groups, but again, since 2000, it's really been very flat. So the idea that our health is getting better and better is, is just uh, not supported by, by the data. Um, another way in which uh, we can look at the, how health is changing is to, to follow people over time and see how many people develop um, various health problems. So what we did here was we took a, a, a sample of, of workers in the health and retirement study who were 51 to 55 and employed uh, at that age, and then we followed them over time and see, well, how many developed first a new medical condition by age 62? So that's the age at which they could first collect Social Security retirement benefits. We defined a medical condition as either arthritis, back problems, cancer, diabetes, heart problems, lung problems, psychological problems, and stroke. Uh, and so we see overall is slightly more than half of, of people develop one of these new conditions um, by age 62 um, and that they were less likely to develop these problems uh, if they had a four-year college degree. So for them it was 55% versus 62% for those uh, who did not complete high school, 61% for those who were only, who had a high school diploma but never attended college. Uh, I think the results are, are more striking if we look at uh, who develops a, a work disability by age 62. So again, starting with a sample of workers in the early 50s who did not have a, a work disability, what percentage developed this by age 62? Overall, it's just slightly under a quarter, 23% but there's a big difference by education. So those who did not uh, complete high school, nearly a third of them developed a work disability, 31%, compared with only 15% uh, for four-year college graduates. Um, also, uh, these work disabilities are more common among people uh, of color. So overall, about 22% of non-Hispanic whites developed uh, a a work disability by age 62 compared with about 30% of African Americans and almost 27% of Hispanics. Um, now I want to focus just on people 63 to 65 um, and just comparing how many have a work disability. This is data again from the Health and Retirement Study. And so what I found overall is uh, comparing 1996, the blue bar, to 2014, the yellow bar, uh, we see that the share with a uh, work disability increased uh, by about uh, five percentage points uh, over, over that period. But again, the increase was, was larger among those who never attended college. There we see a 10 percentage point increase versus um, a seven percentage point increase for those who attended college. So again, these problems are more, uh, more likely to develop, uh, more likely to be experienced by people with limited education. Uh, for women, a similar story. 
Um, the increase in work disabilities over this period, 1996 to 2014, was, was smaller. Um, but again, the increases were larger among those who never attended college than those who attended college. And uh, now I want to compare uh, employment at ages 62 to 64. Uh, so here what we see is consistent with the other studies. Uh, we see an increase in the share of people 62 to 64 who were employed, increasing from 23% in 1996 to 2014 uh, to 32%, so a nine percentage point increase in 2014. But if we compare, uh, we see though that's a big uh, difference in whether or not you have a work disability at those ages. So if you don't have a work disability, for men, we're seeing this 12 percentage point increase over this, this period, about 20 years, going from 36 to 48 uh, percent. But for those with work limitations, the employment rates are declining slightly. Basically, they're the same. There's no statistically significant difference, just falling from 11 to 9 percent. The same for women, an increase 24 to 39 percent in those who don't have a work limitation, but not a significant increase for those with a work limitation. And, and because of this, then we see that big differences in uh, income over the period. So if we look at overall, uh, we look at income, mean real household income, ages 63 to 65. Uh, in 1996, it was about $58,000, increased to about $75,000 in 2014. Uh, but if we, we can then see, though, that big increases for those who don't have work limitations in those years, but virtually no increase for those who had a work limitation. That's true for men. That's true for women. So, so basically what this says is that the um, income is growing more unequal for those in good health versus those with health problems. And so as they're working longer, what happens to people who have health problems who can continue to work longer, they fall further and further behind. And we know that these people with work limitations also tend to have um, less education. They're the more economically vulnerable to start with. Um, another risk that people face as they grow older is uh, the possibility of a layoff. So we see that um, for people who were employed at age of 21 to 25, uh, about a quarter of them experience a job layoff by age 62. Uh, here we're showing how those percentages vary by time period. Um, and you know, even during, so first if we look on the, on the right, you see 31%. That spans the period 2004 to 2014. Uh, so that covers the Great Recession. We'd expect the employment rate to be higher than, it is higher than, but even when the economy was basically was fairly strong in 1992 to 2002, 98 to 2008, just before the Great Recession, before unemployment really rose, um, even then, nearly a quarter of people, uh, old, older folks, experienced some unemployment. What happened with the Great Recession was not so much that the probability of a layoff increased, it was that the duration of the layoff was that much, was so long. And that's really what, what hurt people financially was just that the, uh, the unemployment spells lasted so long. Um, but again, we see the same pattern. Layoffs are much more common among people with limited education, so about a third of folks who did not complete high school laid off versus only 22% of four-year, uh, of, of college graduates. Uh, and we also see that older people are more likely to, when they do become unemployed, they're going to spend more time out of work. Um, so this just shows how does the, uh, the probability, the percentage of laid off workers who were out of work for at least 12 months, um, and you see a big increase with age there. Um, and then also when older people do become, older people who lose their jobs, when they become reemployed, um, they uh, tend to get uh, the, the earnings, the job that they get does not replace as much of their pre-retirement, their pre-layoff earnings as for younger people. So for example, for someone who's laid off at 25, ages 25 to 34, gets a new job, that new job on average is paying 5.6% less than the old job. For someone 62 plus, they lose their job, they get reemployed, they're losing 30% uh, of their income. And in the 50s, when they become reemployed, their earnings are about 18 percentage points lower than they were beforehand. So if you're older and you lose your job, you're going to, it will take a long time to become reemployed, and when you do get reemployed, you're not going to be making nearly as much as you did beforehand. Um, if I'm close to running out of time, let me just uh, 
look ahead a little bit, if we look at the share of folks who are likely to experience any kind of shock, either a, a work disability, a new medical condition, a layoff, this shows how that varies by uh, education. And again, the folks with less education more likely to experience any of these, any of these shocks than people with more education. Um, physically demanding jobs are quite common, and I want to focus your attention on just um, how much they vary by education. So 50% of, of people without a, who did, did not attend college, so they have no more than high school uh, in, in, uh, at ages 55 to 61, uh, are in a physically demanding job compared to only 27% of those who attended college. But even among college graduates or people who attended college, uh, physical work demands are fairly, fairly common. Um, then one last point to raise here is that if we look at less educated older adults, um, they are more likely to say that their employers favor younger workers. Look at the high school graduate, uh, this is comparing 2002, 2008, 2014, 38% in 2014 said their employers favor um, younger workers. Uh, for those with four years of college, 22%. Uh, said their employers favored younger workers. So again, younger, the less educated, more workplace challenges. For all education groups, though, we see that the share who say that their employers favor younger workers has increased from 2002 to 2008 to 2014. So that's an interesting trend. Also important, educational attainment is increasing rapidly from 1980 to 2016 for older workers. Um, so that older workers are more likely to, um, it used to be the case that uh, uh, older workers were less likely to have a college degree than younger workers. Today, it's vir they're virtually as likely as younger workers. And so uh, all of this just highlights some of the challenges that um, people with less education face in the labor force at older ages, and that's something that policymakers need to be aware of. And with that, I will turn it back to Jim and Julian. OK, great. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, for that, that great presentation. Let me thank all three of our experts for their, their excellent and really thought-provoking presentations. We do have some time for questions, so if you'd like to type in a question and send it to us, we can uh, ask either all of our speakers or if you have a question for a particular individual, we can do that as well. And as I, I look at our, our uh, question and answer box, we do have one question right now uh, that's been sent in. And this is for Richard Johnson. And the question is, did the work disabilities occur during work? And I think this is referring to some of the graphs where you presented the data on work disabilities. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so what we did was uh, we compared um, health status for people in their 50s when they didn't have a disability and then say, who reported a disability sometime over the intervening period before they turned 62. Um, and, and so this question says, well, was this, uh, did this disability occur on the job? Uh, not necessarily. Um, we were just looking at what is the likelihood that you're going to develop a problem. Some of that could have happened on the job, um, but it also could have been a health problem that was completely unrelated to the workplace. But, but again, would affect the workplace, but not necessarily caused by the workplace. Right. Okay. Julianne, do you have a question you'd like to, to ask? Um, yes. I actually, here, um, I, I can hold off on that question, but let me go ahead and facilitate another one that came in. And I believe this could be directed at any of our panelists, but the question is, what is the purpose of these studies, and do you recommend any action? So I think, yeah, I think this is meant to be a general question, talking about the, uh, the purpose of the investigations. And um, yeah, I suppose any recommendations that came out of the, the findings that were discussed, I mean, some, some, um, some findings were discussed this way, but um, I leave this to the panel. Hi, this is Jennifer. I can um, take a, um, I can kind of respond. I think in terms from an action perspective, I think there needs to be a recognition for, I, I guess it depends on who your audience is. So for an employer audience or an HR or occupational safety and health, it's important to recognize that um, workers across the age span will have kind of different needs 
and that as they age, they may be more vulnerable um, and certain uh, age categories or categories and different types of uh, people in different types of occupations uh, may be more or less vulnerable and according uh, as a result when you think about your um, occupational safety and health or your worker health strategies you need to keep in mind that it's not a one-size-fits-all solution and that a targeted uh, solution on certain worker groups uh, might be uh, valuable. Um, I'll just stop there because I think there's also different types of implications for employers and researchers, but from a practical perspective, um, that was going to fit what I thought about. Thank you, Dr. Swan. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just, just going to add to that. In the, I think it's, it's important that whichever group, and someone's mentioned nurses, is that you actually work with them. And there's some of the case studies that we found as part of the research we did, um, you know, and that's, that's what it was about. It was about groups of workers working together, looking at what the, you know, the hazards were, and actually coming up with solutions. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's about understanding um, you know, the different groups and their different experiences and vulnerabilities. So, you know, communication is a big thing, I think, especially for those involved in safety and health. And from a, a broader policy, public policy point of view, um, I think th some of, of these results, um, you know, they, they basically highlight the challenges that some older workers face in, uh, in the workforce. And so as we are designing policies and retirement income support programs that really kind of assume that people are going to work, let's say, into their mid-60s instead of retiring at age 62, what happens to the people who, who can't? Um, and so that means, you know, maybe we still want to raise the retirement age. We still want to um, include, uh, have policies that incentivize work at older ages, but also have supports for people who can't. So that could be uh, improved disability insurance benefits uh, to really help people who have health problems that can't work longer, um, but also because we know that the people who are able to work longer tend to have more education and higher earning jobs, then maybe we need to uh, have more progressive retirement income programs. So in the U.S., have our Social Security program um, be even more progressive than it is now to acknowledge the fact that the people with less income, who have a lifetime of low earning jobs, uh, not only are they going to have less Social Security because of that, but they can't work as long, so maybe we need to have Social Security replace a higher share of their pre-retirement earnings because of that. Thank you, everybody. Um, the next question that came in, uh, it's something that Dr. Crawford already addressed to some extent, but uh, we can then um, open it up to the other panel, and that is, have any of you considered nurses as a subpopulation? of age and wage groups. So in case anybody has, has yet to touch on the nurses, uh, feel free. You have a wonderful study in the US, the Nurses Health Study. <laughs> so, um, and I think there's been different groups. We, there has been research done in the UK um, for the National Health Service where they've actually looked at how can, you know, that. They're actually using different tools, designing tools, because we've got, you know, there's about a million people working in the National Health Service in the UK. And it's about, it's not just nurses, but, you know, it's, it's about encouraging them. It's about, you know, ch coming up with solutions, working with specialists in safety and ergonomics to redesign the work. Okay, let me go to our next question then um, from our audience. And this is on the topic of college education by age. Looking at the data showing equal likelihood of a degree by age today, does this change our thinking about using college degrees as a proxy for workplace preparedness? For example, how can we look more towards the technical coding skills that I presume are the driving force behind the increasing sentiment that younger workers are preferred? Right, so I can uh, kick off this discussion. Um, wh what I had 
what our data showed comparing 1980 and 2016, just to summarize, because I was going through that pretty quickly, um, was that it used to be uh, in 1980 that younger people in their late 20s, early 30s were much more likely than uh, workers in their late 50s and early 60s to have a college degree. And today, um, that gap is much uh, smaller than it was for men. It's disappeared completely. For women, um, there's still a slight advantage for uh, for younger people in terms of a college degree, but it is much smaller than it was in 1980. Um, of course, and, and so that's, that's sort of one sense that, well, um, that makes older workers more desirable.